Okay, uh, welcome everyone to Zach's seminar. Uh, it's my big pleasure to introduce uh, my friend Timothy Lugvinenko from University of Cardiff. And uh, Timothy will speak about sky triangulated representations of generalized braids. Thanks, Vanya, and thank you very much for inviting me to give a talk at the seminar. It's, you know, uh, I've been watching since the uh, sort of dawn of online seminars about uh, six months ago, and uh, Zoom Algebraic Geometry Seminar really became an impressive sort of institution, one might almost say, so I'm pretty proud to give a talk here. So uh, this is a talk about a long-term project over 10, which has been motivating a work of myself and my collaborator, Rina Anno from Kansas State University uh, for over 10 years now. So this is finally, finally we've set up enough uh, sort of technical foundations to really start working on the project proper. So uh, in, right now I would like to introduce this, but I also have to mention this is a work in progress and this is sort of uh, ever evolving project. So I will, you know, this will have a number of results, but also have a number of uh, sort of, you know, this is our best guess at the moment. Still, so uh, this is a part of a sort of, of a long categorification story, which starts with Jones polynomial, uh, work of von Jones around about 1985. So what this was, it was revolutionary because it was a very highly non-trivial invariant of oriented links. Now, links are just knots which consist on one, of one string. Orientation means that the, the string is oriented. And polynomial invariant, uh, means that uh, we have a, a way of assigning a polynomial uh, to each oriented link, which is invariant under isotopy. Uh, so the way this works is to a very simplest possible oriented link are not. So uh, a simple loop. Uh, you associate, uh, I mean, at first, at first, let's forget about orientation. Orientation is not gonna matter much uh, for much except for some sign choices. And at the first level of this construction, you don't uh, have any orientation. So to a simple sort of loop, you assign a polynomial Q plus Q minus one. The polynomials will be in one variable here. There are polynomials in Q. And then you have a rule that to any union, disjoint union of two uh, sort of, uh, not you assign uh, a product of polynomials. Now you start with a link, yes, but uh, it is the second rule which will uh, can make a link into a, a disjoint union of several uh, sort of links. And that's, this is the main rule which is called skein relation. And that's the sort of the fundamental and uh, sort of revolutionary part of this. What it tells you is that if you have anywhere in your link a crossing, overcrossing. Then you can uh, write the polynomial of that link as a difference of a polynomial of the same link only with uh, this crossing replaced by sort of vertical cup, uh, cup and cap combination minus q times the uh, same uh, link but with it being replaced by this sort of horizontal cup cap combination. So Clearly, if you are allowed to break up crossings like that, and then you are allowed to take disjoint pieces apart, then you can eventually reduce everything to a bunch of knots, which you know what the polynomial uh, sort of is. So given any plain, planar diagram of, uh, of, the, of, this, of this sort, you can, uh, using this two basic rules, you can uh, assign to it a polynomial. This polynomial f of l will be called the scaled Kaufman bracket. Now, uh, when you have a planar diagram of a knot uh, or, or a link, uh, there is a theorem which says that uh, any two isotopic uh, link, the diagrams uh, of two isotopic links can be related by a sequence of moves called Rydemeister moves. And this assignment of a polynomial is invariant under all of them with exception of Rydemeister move one, so-called untwist. If you have a sort of diagram like this, then you can, you can imagine an isotopy where you just sort of uh, twist this 
here twist this here and it straightens into 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 a line this is the untwist loop and this is what this is not invariant under so to make it invariant uh, under this uh, we introduce scaling and that's where the orientation comes in so having an unscaled kaufman bracket we define kaufman bracket uh, by scaling of uh, f of l by two things first of all we count the numbers of overcrossings and undercrossings and multiply it by q times all um, overcrossings minus two times uh, the number of undercrossings and then we multiply by minus one to the uh, number of um, undercrossings so that now is also invariant and right master move one so this assignment gives uh, produces a polynomial for every planar diagram invariant and right master moves therefore we have an uh, invariant of links uh, up to isotopy and the Jones, uh, I mean the Jones polynomial is then just a sort of simple rescaling of this uh, if to obtain if you take a Jones polynomial which is a Laurent polynomial in this sort of fractional powers of uh, you know in, in essentially t to the power one half and t to the power of minus one half then if you make a variable substitution where t to the power of minus of one half is minus q uh, what you will get is just the um, Kaufman bracket divided by q plus q minus one. You know, uh, pretty much every uh, every Kaufman bracket polynomial will be div divisible by this because uh, that's what uh, corresponds to unknot. So this is like a renormalization where instead of unknot being this, unknot is just one. So uh, so now we can assign a polynomial to every link, but uh, what what is a polynomial? It is a bunch of coefficients. It is a it is a discrete collection of numerical invariants. And much like uh, and then it was discovered by Hovana from about 1999 that these numerical invariants are in fact dimensions of cohomologies of a certain complex. So Hovana lifts the whole construction up to level of homology. So I will not go into detail because this talk is not uh, sort of about this. But if you have a link. Then there is a, a way of assigning to it a complex uh, of graded R modules where R is base commutative frame. And then, uh, but this complex, there'll be some, you'll, have, you'll make some choices throughout uh, the process, but these choices will be invariant under quasi isomorphism of complexes. So if you've got a well defined uh, up to quasi isomorphism complex, you have uh, a collection of cohomology groups which are uniquely assigned to each link, invariant again under all the under isotopies. And the complex is constructed much uh, like the uh, situation above, only we introduce homological skin relation. If you have to assign a complex to a link which has a crossing, you assign a complex to a link where this crossing is replaced by cup and cap uh, vertically and cup and cap horizontally. And then there, there will be a natural morphism from one of these complexes to the other and you take a cone, a, a simple homological cone. So shift, uh, shift this by one, take a direct sum and then modify the differential using this map. So what do you then get? Uh, now, these are graded R modules. So cohomology groups will have will be bi-graded. They will have grading which comes from which cohomology group in the complex they are and the grading coming from the R module itself. So we can recover Jones polynomial as Euler characteristic uh, of this complex. We take a uh, two, so we take a direct sum, uh, minus one to the power of i, q to the power of j, uh, h, i, j cohomology group. And if you do that, you will get uh, Q plus Q minus one times Jones polynomial. So you'll just get Kaufman bracket. So uh, this uh, sort of much like it has been long uh, understood that it's better to have uh, cohomology groups rather than just Betty numbers. Uh, well, uh, it's certainly better to have this important invariant as a sort of as a complex, uh, which then produces unimerical invariants. Finally, uh, there, there was in 2007 by Countis and Kamnitzer a rather beautiful uh, way of constructing uh, this uh, complex, a different one for any given link. So uh, they came up with a way of computing Hovind of homology by constructing an action of tangle calculus on derived category of uh, a certain 
slice now this is th this will be a pretty sort of um, fundamental object in this uh, in this story uh, I t uh, so this is a flag variety this index here 2m means uh, the dimension of the space we're taking flags in and uh, we take we, once we start with a link we take n to be large enough to be bigger than uh, a number of sort of parallel strands you see from any perspective in your link. And so, and then uh, this means a certain partition of 2n which, which corresponds to a partial flag in it. So we construct an action of tangle calculus on derived categories of certain slices of, cotang of total spaces of cotangent bundles of uh, partial flag varieties in this huge dimensional space. So again, I will not go into full details of the construction, but the way their constructions work is as follows. You slice up your link horizontally into, th into tiny slices such that in each bond you have uh, basic uh, sort of things uh, such as a cup, a cap, or a, cr a crossing, or a bunch of parallel lines, the sort of the generators of your tangle calculus. And then um, there is a procedure then uh, they comments are simply define the functors and uh, to each comp combination of endpoints you assign uh, a certain partial flag variety for example if there are no endpoints the very beginning of the of this story then we just have vector spaces so empty flag if we have four points then we have uh, uh, flag in this huge space with dimensions one two three and four here we have flag with dimensions one, two, three, and four again. And here we have two points. So we have flag with, uh, with dimensions just one and two. So you take uh, sort of, if there are K points, uh, if, you're, if there are K endpoints, you take sort of K flags in this two n dimensional space. Uh, so once you know how to represent cups, caps, and crossings by functors be between these varieties, what's known as an action, uh, action of the tangle calculus, you can then write a functor for each of these uh, slices of your link. When you, when you compose these functors together, they produce uh, a functor from direct category of vector spaces to direct category of vector spaces. So let me, uh, and the main thing is that we once again see skein relation here, but now not on the level of uh, sort of uh, vector spaces or on the level of homology, but on the level of triangulated categories. The, the reason we see it is that the functor we assign to overcrossing is a cone of a, of a composition of functors we assign to cup and a cap. So this is this uh, vertical cup and cap combination. And in our calculus, the uh, cap is the right adjoint of a cup. So from a composition of a functor and its right adjoint, there is a unique uh, sort of adjunction co-unit into identity, and we take a cone of that. What we obtain is this. Now, you see identity here should be understood as a functor which corresponds to two vertical lines. So this, in, in the world of sort of, of, uh, of, of this braids or of a tangle calculus, is just identity, I, I, identity, to, uh, I, identity is sort of braid. You have two vertical lines. So what this tells you is that the functor which corresponds to a crossing is once again a cone of a cup and cap functor one of one type, which is here is this composition of adjoints, and a cup and cap of the second type, which is just identity. So to the picture above, we'll have a, we'll, we'll assign to our link a functor uh, from drug category of vector spaces to vector spaces, uh, which looks like this. You know, we have four functors here, one, two, three, and four. And this functor, we then show, uh, well, or rather Cautis and Kamnisar show that uh, the, uh, this is invariant under itemized moves. So, and then you will get a, you'll, 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 you'll get an assignment of a functor from direct category vector space to direct category vector spaces, which is a link invariant. And what you can do is you can apply this functor to the generator of direct, direct category vector space is a very simple uh, category. It's generated by one dimensional vector space in degree zero. So apply your functor to that and uh, you will get a complex of vector spaces. And then there is a sort of slight rescaling. If you take ith and jth uh, bigraded cohomology of, uh, of this complex of vector spaces, which you get, you will get hi plus, plus jth 
Jth uh, Hovenov homology. So basically, uh, out of the complex of that, uh, out of link comes a functor. Applying this functor to the generator of this category, you get a complex of vector spaces up to quasi isomorphism, and its cohomologies uh, compute Hovenov homology for you. So uh, our story uh, comes when you look at this picture, and then you, when you actually look at how all these functors are constructed, you see uh, that. Uh, See this thing here, directory of n n Slodovy slice. It is a certain slice inside the full uh, partial flux space, which essentially I don't want to go into exactly into what it is, but uh, imagine, I mean, a point in a uh, cotangent bundle to a flux space is a flux plus a nil potent operator on this two n dimensional space. And n n here corresponds that we take new potent operators uh, which determine where in the fiber of the cotangent space uh, of the cotangent bundle you are. We take them off, we take these new potent operators to be of n n Jordan type. And then what you get is a rather bad space and then you uh, desingularize it, you sort of, you modify it to a nice space. And that is what this is. But the point is that we are only looking at direct vectors of small slices of partial flux spaces. All these constructions, the way these functors are constructed, make sense in a full, uh, uh, um, in the full derived category of cotangent bundle of partial flux space. Uh, however, the tangent cal tangle calculus does not act on these spaces. The relations which must hold between cups, caps, and sort of and crossings do not uh, only hold in these tiny little pieces, uh, tiny little slices of uh, the picture, but not on the whole on the whole sort of uh, partial flux spaces. So there is some richer structure, which occurs here, which then, when restricted to the slices, give, gives you a tangle calculus. So the question is, what is this sort of richer structure? So just a second. So this is basically our answer. So uh, I will define something called a generalized braid category. So a no normal braids, ordinary classic braids, uh, on n strands form a group. But here, roughly, uh, we want to take intuitively, we want to take braids where strands are allowed to touch. This immediately introduces two things multiplicity of a strand. You know, when two strands uh, of multiplicity uh, join, they must form a strand of a higher multiplicity. And it also means that endpoints are no longer just uh, sort of n separate nails. You have now different endpoint configurations which correspond to uh, which strands of which multiplicity you start with. So the objects are the other sort of the objects in this category are the various endpoint configurations uh, of uh, uh, your strands of various multiplicity uh, such that the total multiplicity is n. So it's just an ordered partition of n. You have a bunch of numbers uh, whose sum is n. So the way to think about it is here, for example, uh, we have one five, one partition, and we have two one three, which is another partition. And this, correspond, this one corresponds to a strand uh, of multiplicity one and a strand of multiplicity five, and this one corresponds to a strand of multiplicity two, strand of multiplicity one, and strand of multiplicity three. And so morphisms on a sort of intuitive level, I just uh, sort of uh, diagrams uh, between these two endpoint configurations, which are these sort of strands where we allow uh, braids, where we allow strands to touch, to join, or to split up. Now, in this language, it's very difficult to uh, describe sort of the category we want, because that gives you, if you, if you just say, uh, such objects up to isotopy, you run into all sorts of uh, problems. Uh, so after a long uh, while, we came up with a following definition, uh, which is less uh, uh, sort of topological, but is much more manageable. So rigorously, a morphism between two endpoint configurations given by partition of N is an oriented trivalent graph, which is equipped with a coloring of its edges by integers from one to n, so strand multiplicity, satisfying flow condition at each trivalent, uh, at each vertex of this graph, you either have two uh, strands coming in and then the strand coming out must have uh, same multiplicity as total multiplicity of the strands coming in or vice versa. Uh, 
And then you have one valence start point vertices. So, you know, uh, basically these correspond to uh, two strands of different multiplicities coming together and running as a sort of strand of a higher multiplicity. And this corresponds to vice versa, a strand splitting up into two strands of lower multiplicity. And then you have a sort of beginning and the end of the diagram. Start point vertices, uh, which uh, you, you have some number of them, but their total multiplicity must be n. And then you have end point vertices. Again, uh, th there can be different number of them, but the total multiplicity, once again, has to be n. And we, so here's an example. This uh, diagram becomes this trivalent graph. It, it, only, it only has one trivalent, uh, tri trivalent vertex, and then it has uh, uh, two uh, start point uh, vertices and three end point vertices. So we consider, in order to have overcrossings and undercrossings, we consider this trivalent graph with an embedding into uh, a sort of uh, R2 uh, cross uh, unit interval. So we think of this as uh, infinite plane, which then uh, runs vertically from zero to one. And all the start points lie in this plane at level zero. All the end points lie in this plane in level, on level one. And orientation of our uh, graph projects positively onto zero one. So you, 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 you are not allowed to loop back. You, you're not allowed, your strand's not allowed to go like this and then suddenly loop back. We don't have cups and caps. We, check, we just have joinings, splittings, and crossings. So these, these generalized braids, these oriented trivalent graphs embedded into this three-dimensional uh, space are considered up to two things, isotopies of embedded graphs and multi-fork and multi-merge relations. So these are in relations we sort of embed by, for, by sort of force, which uh, tell you that if you have a strand of multiplicity P plus Q plus R, then splitting, it, splitting off first a strand of multiplicity P and then strand of multiplicity Q is the same thing as first splitting a strand of multiplicity R and then splitting off a strand of multiplicity Q. So multi-merge is exactly the same thing, but turn this diagram 180 degrees. It tells you that uh, the same rules applies to merging strings. So actually, since I've uh, written out these notes uh, a little while ago, uh, there's been some development. We've realized that there is an extra piece of structure involved in this, which we see in actual representations of the structure. So, uh, but I, 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 that, that, cons that new definition is still under construction. But basically what we would like, we would actually like to consider this graph with framing. So imagine each of this, uh, each of the strands being drawn on a small ribbon, not, not, not a sort of uh, flat, uh, not a zero dimensional sort of one dimensional edge, but a tiny flat ribbon. So we want to have this because then we also have twisting of a ribbon. A strand of any multiplicity can be sort of twisted over. So there exists a, uh, basically an auto equivalence, uh, an invertible element which goes from, uh, uh, which um, goes from point of any multiplicity to itself. Uh, I, I'm, uh, this will become clear as I as I proceed through the talk. But uh, the more, at the moment, I'm, I'm not prepared to give the um, to, to give that new definition. But if you keep in mind uh, that there is a framing here and there is and uh, there is a twisting of the ribbons, some of the uh, elements in, in further part of the stock will become much much clearer. So now composition, as usual in this game, is just given by concatenation, and we also have to scale because if we can, if we sort of concatenate to such embeddings, they will be embedded from from level zero to level two, and then we scale everything to being from level zero to level one. And identity is just parallel vertical strands. So example, a generalized braid category uh, of uh, on two strands has two possible endpoint configurations. You either have one strand of multiplicity two, or you have two strands of multiplicity one. And all morphisms are generated by uh, a fork, a single possible fork, split up uh, multiplicity two into multiplicity one and one. The only possible merge, merge two multiplicity one strands into multiplicity two strands, and the only two possible crossings, sort of over crossing and under crossing. So, now, these, of course, are subject to, to certain relations. So uh, a 
first sort of level of kind of the first kind of representations of this structure you can consider uh, is a weak categorical representation, or as we call it sometimes, sort of topological representation. So what it is, it's an assignment of a partition to every element, to, to every object of uh, GBRN, to every partition of M. You assign a category to every generalized braid, to every morphism between these objects. You, can see, you, you assign a functor in such a way that composition of uh, func uh, functors uh, respects the composition of braids. Alternatively, this could be described as a collection of fork functors, merge functors, and crossing functors for all possible merges, uh, forks, and crossings in GBRN, which are subject to generalized braid relations. Now, these, uh, we, um, one of the things that which will appear in the first paper on the subject, which will be, which will be called uh, scheme triangulated representations of generalized braids, will be uh, giving a list of these relations uh, in uh, arbitrary generality. I mean, we have this list, but it's rather difficult, uh, you know, proving it is a, is a very, very non-trivial uh, uh, job. So uh, the first sort of major content here will be- uh, Yeah. Yes. Can I ask a question? Yes, please. I mean, the category of braids and tangles, they're usually defined as monoidal categories with some properties and free monoidal categories. So is there a similar definition here? Uh, uh, I, uh, we haven't thought about it in this way yet. I, I know what, you're, what you mean, although uh, surely it wouldn't be free monoidal. Uh, but, um, but usually, I mean, there is something like parenthesized braids, where you have like, where you don't require strict associativity of the uh, tensor product. But then you would have to like several different layers of packing strands. So you seem to have like only one layer of packing strands in your, in your definition. Let, let um, me let me think about it because okay. we, we 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 didn't sort of we first want to get a, de a definition of this i mean uh, as i will proceed in the talk you will see that we are not inventing this out of our head uh, there are several okay. uh, uh, real life constructions which we are i mean what we're doing with definition of generalized braid category is we are trying for many years now to describe a structure which acts on several uh, um, natural sort of in several natural geometrical algebraic contexts. So once we have okay. a proper Thanks. definition of it, uh, we, we can start interpreting it. And I will come. I will then come back and think about your remark now. Thank you very much uh, for that. Okay. But, uh, so the question is, uh, but this is somehow not a terribly helpful way of doing this. I mean, you would never want to really check this set of relations. And when, and basically, in some sense, we're not interesting. This is far too weak a notion. Uh, uh, however, remember that in the Hovanov story and in the Jones story, uh, essentially, once you had the generators, you had a sort of a single relation uh, which uh, in Hovenov case was this was this sort of homological homological scan relation, which essentially you didn't even have to have these generators. This point of scan relation was how to cook a crossing out of essentially analogs of a fork and emerge. So question is when are the categories when the categories CP are triangulated, as we saw in Gauti's comments, for example, what are the analogs of scan relation? Sort of um, what are there any simpler relations? Because imposing relations on this level is sort of not making full use of, uh, of, your, uh, of the data you have. If you're working with triangulated categories, as we most often do in, geome in, sort of in geometric representation theory and uh, in algebraic geometry, when this is a derived category of an algebraic variety, for example, we have a triangulated structure here. So can we somehow use that triangulated structure to, to give a simpler, uh, kind of uh, relations than this lot. Uh, can we package these up in these triangulated relations? So answering this question, what are the analogs of scan relation is the main goal of this research project. We expect this to be a set of conditions and relations sufficient to generate the whole representation of generalized braid category from just the set of fork functors. So once you have these, 
provided scan relation satisfied, you have representation of this um, of this guy. We call the we call the topological representations of GBRM, which satisfy this triangulated relation, scan triangulated. Hence the name. They're sort of the, the triangulated analogs of scheme relation. At present, we do not. We have a conjecture, but we do not yet have a fully fully general definition. We'd like to throw our weight uh, behind. We have definitions for n equals two and three, and we have proof of of this fact. We also have two examples of uh, representations of generalized braid category for arbitrary n, and we. I mean, the work that we've been doing is we've been extrapolating the general definition of what is a scheme triangulated representation by looking at these two, uh, two examples. So let me now talk about them. So first, so, sorry, first let me give, uh, let, let me show you what scheme triangulated representations looks like, look like in two cases where we do fully understand this. Because this will actually, um, I, certainly, what is a scheme triangulation of GBR2 will look very familiar. So a categorical representation of GBR2 is scheme triangulated if. The two, remember, there are only two endpoint configurations, uh, sort of two separate, point, two separate strands and one multiple strand. So, we, so the, such representation consists of two categories. We ask them to be enhanced triangulated categories. Then we ask for the, uh, the merge functor to be the left adjoint of the fork functor. So this will be always the case. In any skin triangulated representations, you get merges sort of, you know, uh, vertical symmetry of your braid corresponds to uh, taking adjoints. So uh, um, a merge is a left adjoint of the corresponding fork. Now, this is the scan relation, once again, which we saw in, uh, in Kautis um, and Kamnister's story. We ask for the cross, the one, one crossing to be the cone of adjunction unit from identity to composition of uh, the F and its right adjoint G. So in diagrammatic language, this overcrossing is the cone of identity going to uh, the, um, to this sort of joining, which roughly corresponds to cup and cap combination. I mean, notice uh, that the morphism here goes as a unit and not co-unit. It's purely for matter of convenience. We want to have left adjoints because in this business, left adjoints look simpler than right adjoints if you start with these guys. I mean, uh, as you know, if you have a, a for the functor defined by DG by module, then uh, it's sort of left adjoint is much easier to describe than it's, uh, than it's right adjoint. So, uh, uh, well, or ra rather, rather what I mean to say is that the restriction uh, is that uh, restriction of scalars have a uh, nice left adjoint, which is extension of scalars. But uh, anyway, now this, this looks like a mysterious. So we impose another condition. If now we take a cone of a composition of uh, this fork uh, with the merge. So now the functor and its left adjoint and the adjunction co-unit into identity, we ask for this to be an auto equivalence. So what this tells you is that if you take a cone of natural morphism from this guy to this guy, what you will get is an auto equivalence of this category uh, with multiplicity two. This auto equivalence is, is the ribbon twist. If identity is just a sort of a flat ribbon in which this graph is drawn, then there is also a morphism from this category to itself, which corresponds to this ribbon twisted once. So this is why this one, once you start, uh, you, you know, this wasn't the part where we didn't realize that originally it was framed until we were able to prove that in all our examples, we always have this uh, auto, or the equivalence which we can construct out of forks and merges, which corresponds, which gives you the uh, sort of non-trivial uh, or the equivalence of uh, of a category corresponding to just all, all all the all points stuck together. So now a proposition: uh, if you have an enhanced exact functor such that the skin relations in three and four hold, so these two cones are auto-equivalences. Then if we define G to be the left adjoint of it, and if we define uh, the crossing, overcrossing, to be this cone, then we get a scan triangulated representation of GBR2. 
But look, uh, I've just told you that I have a functor such that it's uh, sort of dual, uh, so it's uh, spherical twist and it's uh, sort of uh, dual spherical co-twist are equivalences. So I've just told you that scheme triangulate representations of GBR2 are essentially spherical functors. So any scheme triangulate representation of this just reduces to a single spherical functor. So, uh, I mean, uh, this stuff has been motivating. Uh, this is what motivated my collaborator, Anna, over 14 years ago now to start looking into what uh, sort of, uh, into really uh, sort of uh, nitty gritty of, of uh, spherical <laughs> functors. So now let me uh, sort of also give a definition for uh, case n equals three. So a categorical representation of uh, GBR3 is scheme triangulated if, now we have four categories, you know, uh, multiplicity three, one and two, two and one, and one, one, one. And they all have to be again enhanced triangulated categories. Second condition is that all the sort of, all the relations which come from here, all the scan relations which come from GBR2 have to hold. Notice that we can embed GBR2 into GBR3 by taking any diagram and drawing one vertical disjoint strand either on the left or on the right of it. So this is what I mean. The star means the diagram in GBR, the morphism in GBR2, or a part, you know, uh, on objects, I have a partition and I simply add disjoint sort of one or the end of the partition or at the beginning of the partition. And if I have a diagram, I draw a vertical uh, line on the right or the left of it. So these two embeddings induce scheme triangulated representations of GBR2. So for these two, two embeddings, GBR2 into GBR3, all those relations hold. And then there are relations, new relations, relations which come purely uh, from GBR3. And they are, once again, we can obtain the overcrossings and undercrossings of two over one uh, as cones of certain combinations of uh, forks and merges. So what I don't do here and what I will not do throughout this talk is I will not define uh, the morphisms here. So this is quite clear. You have two point and one point. You merge them into multiplicity three strand. That's one functor that's merge. And then you have a fork. And here uh, you, do the opposite thing. You first split, you, you first fork this multiplicity two strand into uh, multiplicity one and one. So you have a sort of one, 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 category one, one, one here in the middle. And then you merge these two together. Now, because of the adjunctions between G and F, there are natural uh, sort of uh, adjunctions, units and co-units produce you uh, these uh, morphisms here. And if you take these combinations of fork and merges and take a cone of the na natural morphism between them, you will get, uh, you will get your overcrossing and undercrossing. So, so in an R if you start with just a representation of GBR3, this is a condition that, the, that this uh, overcrossing and undercrossing has to be uh, isomorphic to these cones. So now this is once again what we saw uh, in case of GBR2. This cone has to be an autoequivalence. So this now is, uh, now this is not a cone any longer. I now have a three, uh, I now have a th sort of two-step complex on three objects as sort of an identity functor from uh, category three to itself. And then you, I have this sort of non-trivial functors where I first uh, merge, uh, fork and then merge in every, possible different way. And again, there exists natural morphism between them. I take a convolution and this has to be an auto-equivalence. So this is an auto non-trivial auto-equivalence from uh, category three to category three, which again corresponds to a ribbon twist in this uh, strand. So uh, if uh, once, it, once we rewrite it in the proper language, it will be a condition that the ribbon twist uh, uh, morphism corresponds to this to this. But now we have two completely new conditions. This is something that you have not uh, seen in this theory before. We have two natural complexes, which look very similar to this one, but th th their convolution has to be acyclic. And what was proved, what me, myself and Rina uh, have proven last year is that if we have a system of enhanced triangulated categories and exact functors corresponding to uh, uh, objects and morphisms of GBR3. And 
if each uh, g is uh, le is left adjoint of each f, uh, if just looking at these functors uh, produce a uh, scheme triangulated representation of GBR2, and now if all these conditions hold, so convolutions of complexes in three, four, and five, so the, this complex, this complex, and this complex are auto equivalences, and then convolutions of complex of these two complexes are acyclic. So again, I start with just functors F. I take their left adjoints and they become my mergers. These are forks. Then I, using this, I can define uh, what, the, uh, what the overcrossings are. And using five, I can define what a ribbon twist is. And then if also the convolutions of complexes in six and seven are acyclic, then it gives me a, a representation of GBR3, which we call scheme triangulated. So this, this, this is how this theory looks when it's been fully worked out for, for a given n. So what are these examples uh, which we are motivated by, uh, which, uh, which we believe we have for arbitrary n, which we model our theory on? So. so motivation. We came up with these definitions by studying two examples which we believe to be scheme triangulated representations of GBRN. First is categorical nil hecke algebra over an arbitrary enhanced triangulated category. Second is the one I've mentioned on the very, on the very first slide. These are derived categories of full uh, cotangent bundles of uh, partial flag varieties in CN. So let me first um, tell you uh, about categorical nil hecke algebras. So there was a beautiful result of Ed Siegel, which was a beautiful paper. Uh, it's kind of paper I wish I had written because uh, it, is, it presents results so natural, you just want to quote it uh, when you have a chance. So the statement is any auto equivalence of, a triangulate, of an enhanced triangulated category that can be written as a spherical twist around the spherical function. So there was a lot of sort of in geometric context, there was some attention given to uh, sort of the, sub, uh, the subgroup of auto equivalence group of a derived category, which is generated by sort of twisting spherical objects. Uh, so that you know might have give, give, gave an impression of spherical twists being some kind of special auto equivalences. But the point is, in this uh, in the proof of this theorem, what you do is you construct a completely sort of uh, using formal DG categorical methods a source category and a functor from it to C such that twist around it is your auto equivalence. Uh, geometrically, it's pretty useless because uh, this source category will not be geometrical. Now, in the language above, notice that an, uh, a spherical functor is a uh, scheme triangulated representation of GBR2. And an auto equivalence, quite trivially, is a uh, representation of braid group on two strands. The only thing that exists, the only braids which exist in two strands are crossing and its inverse. So this theorem can be reformulated as any triangulated categorical representation of uh, braid group on two strands extends to a scheme triangulated representation of generalized braid, braid, braid group on two strands. And what we've discovered, to much to our surprise, is that this seems to be true completely generally. So if you give me any triangulated categorical representation of a uh, classical braid group, so if you give me n auto equivalences which braid, so give me a triangulated category and n uh, minus one auto equivalences, sorry, which satisfy braid relations then I can construct uh, a full sort of network of categories which corresponds to a scheme triangulated representations of GBR uh, N. And this representation will be given by what we call categorical nil hecke algebra. I will explain why is this sort of, it's not, it's not really an algebra, it's a category, but uh, this category we view this really as an algebra. And the various, uh, uh, so this will be the category which corresponds to uh, multiplicity n endpoint. And all the other categories will be sitting inside it as essentially subalgebras. So why am I talking about DG categories as sort of algebras and subalgebras? Uh, sub well, uh, let me try to uh, give an example. Uh, I don't have time to give to fully define this theory. So let me give an example for n equals three, which should make definition pretty clear. So if you have a, suppose we have an enhanced triangulated category with two uh, braiding auto equivalences, H1 and H2. 
because I'm in a DG enhanced setting, uh, H1 and H2 can be represented by CC by modules. Then I can define uh, essentially uh, CC by modules with structures, uh, with multiplicative structure, with structure of, an, of actually uh, C algebra. The, uh, so C111 is just C itself. C21 and C12 are square zero extensions of C by mild equivalences, H1 and H2. These are what uh, the source categories were defined in Ed's, uh, in Ed's theorem. If you have a one of equivalence and triangulated categories, then the source category for a spherical functor is just the square zero extension. So I do just that for uh, both my um, uh, auto equivalences. And now the category C3 is defined as a direct sum of bimodules C plus H1 plus H2 plus H1, H2 plus H2, H1 plus uh, H1, H2, H1, or isomorphically H2, uh, H1, H2, which is in a sense square zero again, uh, H1 squ uh, squared equals zero and H2 squared equals zero. And then uh, I define a rather, uh, so, or rather what I mean by this is that I define a structure of an algebra now on this CC by module uh, by taking sort of a tensor product of this with itself and saying that, uh, you know, anything uh, that concatenates into something that sits here already is uh, multiplies like that uh, and uh, everything else is zero. So what we get is a categorical analog of Neo-Hecke algebra. What you do is you take uh, a uh, braid relations and impose X relations that the square uh, of each of your generators is zero. So, once I have these, now these are all algebras in a category of CC by modules. So in fact, uh, if you have a DG algebra in a category of, uh, of CC by module, if you have an algebra in a category of CC by modules, you get out of it a DG category with the same objects uh, as C, but morphisms now defined by this uh, by module, the structure of an algebra. algebra. So in fact, uh, these definitions give me four DG categories. And now, uh, because this, this, and this are subalgebras here, I have restriction of scalar functors. You know, if I start uh, from uh, from something that's a module over the big algebra, of course, I can get a module for each of the smaller subalgebras. So my fork functors here are really just uh, the uh, restriction of scalars. And of course, my uh, merge functors going backwards, the left adjoints are induction, of, are, ex are extension of scalar functors. This is why I, I ended up needing left adjoint because I really want to define it like this. Uh, and then I, what I now have to define is crossings. And I define uh, my uh, cro uh, sort of crossing uh, where I do uh, over crossing uh, over first two strands and nothing over second strand is H1. Over, uh, over crossing of second two strands and nothing on the first strand is H2. And now uh, here are the difficult ones. This is uh, sort of two strands cross over one strand sort of in two possible directions. So the way this is done is uh, very algebraically in a sense. I take C to one and I tensor it over C with bimodule H2, H1. And then I prove that this is actually isomorphic to taking C12 and tensing it over C with H2, H1. And then I define, uh, I, I show that I can do similar thing uh, with H1 minus one, H2 minus one. And I get another uh, sort of, you know, this is isomorphic to this. And uh, I define the undercrossing to be this. And now they're inverse to each other. What, in fact, proving this isomorphisms is the important bit. Once you've proved that these things are isomorphic, look, uh, if you tensor this by this, you can choose this presentation and this presentation. Then as you tensor, H2, H1 gets canceled out by H1 minus one, H2 minus one, and you get C to one tensor over C with C to one. Tensoring a subalgebra over an algebra which applies in, of course, uh, uh, just collapses this into one copy of C to one. So we just get diagonal by module, which is the identity function. And the second sort of uh, oh, two one crossing is defined in a similar way. 
So uh, these are not equivalences because these are clearly their inverses. So incomplete, you could, from this you can pretty much guess what happens in dimension uh, sort of n. You, you just define the bottom, the sort of the category at the very bottom, Cn, to be the full categorical new Hecke algebra defined in, in this way. You define uh, all your forks and merges to be restriction and extension of scalars. And now I have to tell you in full generality how are overcrossings and undercrossings defined. And then there is a beautiful formula. If you, so suppose I write uh, sort of, I have an overcrossing from, uh, I, I have a crossing from a partition called P to a partition called Q. For example, this one is from partition two one to partition one two. So I claim that if I take the category C, which corresponds to partition P, and then tensor it over C, now um, take a permutation P to Q. So in this case, take a permutation, I mean, this should be read as one, two, three, and this should be read as two, three, one. So I first take uh, all numbers from one to N, I partition them like this, and then I permute this as uh, to have a sort of, uh, to have a crossing of multiple strands. So, uh, so this, is a part this is a permutation, sorry, one, two, three, going to uh, three, one, two. So I decompose this into basic transpositions. And to each of these basic transpositions, I have one of my, my HIs, uh, my generators of my new Hecke algebra corresponding. And then I just define this to be this. And uh, it turns out that uh, this same monomial multiplied on the right with tensored with CP and tensored on the left with CQ gives you the same thing. And this thing is your uh, crossing over and just default doing the same thing with their inverses produces undercrossings and they're completely tautologically uh, give you auto-equivalences. So there is a question, how can we write, the, but for, to formulate, to formulate this in the framework I've uh, described, I really need to write this uh, as a convolution of a, uh, of a complex consisting of forks and merges. So how would we do that? So, uh, uh, so just to stress again, this, is, this, this categorical new Hecke algebra exists uh, for any n, and uh, this is one of the things we've been studying uh, to understand what is a scheme triangulated representations of, of these generalized braids. So let me quickly describe the other. I think I'm starting to run out of time. Uh, Vanya, could you tell me uh, how much more time do, do I have? Actually, you have plenty of time because uh, the talk is one hour and uh, you started late. So, yeah, so ten, I, ten I, minutes, I, I, uh, yeah. take ten, 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 ten minutes, okay. eight, eight minutes. Yeah, yeah. I, so eight minutes? Absolutely. Great. Great. So I will try not to run over by, by more than that. So second example is cotangent bundle flag varieties. And, uh, you know, new Hecke algebras we came up with recently, this guy is what we've been studying for 10 years. This is where our work on spherical functors and, and PN functors come from. So we have a conjecture that there is a scheme triangulated, but, you know, originally this conjecture just said there is a categorical representation of GBRN where a category corresponding to each partition of unity, or of partition of n, sorry, is derived bounded uh, coherent derived category of cotangent bundle of variety of partial flux uh, in, in space of dimension n defined by this partition. So what I mean by this, if I have a partition P1, comma P2, and so on to PK, then the flux I want to, uh, to deal with is the ones where the, the present dimensions are P1, P1 plus P, P2, P1 plus P2 plus P3, and so on, uh, up to P1 plus P2 plus blah, 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 plus PK, which is uh, the M, and so this, this is the subspace corresponding to the whole of CN. So dim of each of this VI is just I, so this index corresponds to dimension of this in the flag. So for example, uh, a partition one, two corresponds to P2. You know, this is uh, flux zero, then V1, and then V3, which is P2. So you just have a choice of a, a one dimensional space in C3, which is P2. And if you have one, 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 this corresponds to a full flux. Clearly from this definition, uh, any full partition, one, 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 corresponds to uh, the complete flux space. And for example, to give a slightly more complicated example, two, one, three corresponds to, basically the mnemonic is that the, uh, the, 
spaces between the dots, sort of the gaps in, uh, in your partition, the walls in your partition, is what corresponds to the dimensions of the subspaces present. So we, here we have dimension zero, dimension one is not present, dimension, uh, so, sorry, uh, so zero, um, dimension one is not present, dimension two is present, dimension three is present, and then dimensions four, five are not present. So this is a, a partial flux zero, V2, V3, and C6. So uh, now uh, to each, and now uh, I would like to define what the functor, what the fork functor uh, looks like for this, uh, for derived categories of this partial flux, contingent bundles over partial flux varieties. So suppose I have a fork uh, which splits a single multiplicity strand PI stuck in the middle of this long partition into two uh, uh, strands of multiplicity QI and QI plus one. So I have two partitions with these properties essentially, you know, but you know, the definitions of Q are just there uh, written in such a way as to give this picture. So if I have this situation, remember the uh, dimensions of spaces present in flux correspond to gaps between strands. So this partition corresponds to partial flux, which has one extra uh, uh, subspace present in that flock compared to this one. The one that corresponds, you can see it here. Here uh, we have uh, V uh, going from um, Q1 blah 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 QI minus one and then plus QI but in down here we don't have plus QI, we just have plus PI which is plus QI plus QI plus one. So we have, we go straight from this to this uh, downstairs, but upstairs we have this extra subspace. So we have a forgetful map, which forgets uh, the, the subspace and uh, drops us from this flag variety to this flag variety. So then there's a completely standard uh, construction on the level of cotangent bundles. Instead of a, getting a straight function, we get a, this ladder. So what we do is I take cotangent bundle of a flag variety downstairs, the smaller part of flag variety, and then I, pull back this cotangent bundle to uh, the bigger flux variety. What I get is I get a vector bundle on the bigger flux variety, which is not its full cotangent bundle, but some sub bundle of it. So now uh, this here just corresponds to uh, a Grassmannian vibration because uh, what, what, what happens here is that this is F upper star of this cotangent bundle. So we really just forget this thing in the flock. And this here is a closed embedding of the same codimension. And then the fork functor as usual is first we pull back, uh, first uh, there is a sort of inverse image, uh, derived inverse image over this Grassmannian vibration and then uh, derived direct image uh, over this closed embedding. Uh, this is exactly the same uh, in all uh, papers which deal with this. So th this is what I meant by saying it's exactly the same construction as in Countess uh, Kamnitzer, except we don't uh, take a small slice of a, a flag variety, we take the whole thing. So G is just its left adjoint. And now uh, the difficult thing in this project was to define these crossings. What happens when you take crossings um, uh, of multiple strands? And this is the convolution of something called a Ricard complex. So consisting of forks and merges as before. Now Ricard complexes are generalization by Cautis Commissar Likata of so-called splendid complexes of Jeremy Ricard. Again, let me just give an example. So for example, uh, Ricard complex for 2112 is precisely the little complex we've seen uh, in the example of uh, GBR3. And if you take this cone, you produce uh, this 2-1 crossing. However, you can also define, you can define Ricard complex for arbitrary P and Q. And for example, uh, if the Ricard complex from 2-1 to 2-1 looks like this. Now, uh, this is, Ricard complex is slightly unnatural. They only exist in this particular context because they heavily use the fact that uh, left and right adjoint uh, in this situation to uh, F differ by a shift. So, so this shift here essentially allows us to uh, do 
turn an adjunction uh, sort of a unit into an adjunction co-unit and uh, and produce a map here. So differentials here make heavy use of the pulp identification of left and right arteries. So this is no good for us in uh, our fully general situation where we do not make any such assumptions in proximal matches. So Ricard complex con consists of compositions of F and G's, but the differentials are defined using the fact that left and right are joints differ by shift. This holds in the flag radical, but not in general. It doesn't hold in Neil Heck example. So question, is there a more general notion which specializes to Ricard complexes for flag varieties and to bimodules which we saw uh, for Neil Heck algebras? So can we find some nice complex on fork and merge uh, functors? which in flag variety case would have some uh, acyclic parts which will peel off and reveal Ricard complex. And in Neil Hecke example, collapse to this uh, very nice bimodules there. So this is probably the, the biggest progress we've made on this project since we got started on it. Uh, earlier on this year, we've understood what these are. We call them skein complexes. So if we have an assignment of categories and functors to uh, objects and fork generators of generalized braid category, and if each of these fork uh, functors has a left adjoint, then for any numbers p, q, r, s, such that p plus q and r plus s equal to n, we can define a skein complex. So let me give uh, a quick example. So here's, uh, so the elements of skein complex are indexed by, uh, ordered partitions of M. So P and Q are the partitions, uh, is, are the, is the partition at the bottom. So uh, skein complex L PQRS is a, is a braid from PQ to RS. The, what indexes the elements of skein complex is the partition in the middle. You know, the element indexed by X, the X bar, partition X bar passes in the middle of it through this uh, configuration of endpoints. And then it's, there's pretty much the only thing you can do. You uh, take a minimal common refinement of uh, the middle, what you have to pass through and where you start from. So for example, in this case, to get from two, three to three, two, the minimal common refinement is two, one, two. Here, similarly, if you have three, two and four, one, the minimal common refinement is this. So you get this and for every possible element of, of GBRN, you have uh, one of these. And then the differentials uh, uh, are made, uh, um, uh, and the um, degree uh, is uh, then just uh, the uh, number sort of, uh, in, the, in, in this case, an element uh, of uh, three, two in, uh, has degree one minus two minus one. So the differentials are, are now made completely of adjunction units uh, and co-units for F and Gs, no identifying of adjuncts. So now I can sort of finish this talk by now looking, telling you what essentially our conjecture for what scheme triangulated representations are. So if you write out all these scheme complexes, for example, in case n equals two, you will get a picture like this. And if you analyze it, you will see that uh, you will have at the corner you will always get uh, the complex which defines this ribbon twist auto equivalence. Down each side of the square, vertically and horizontally, you will get something aside from the corners. You'll get something always that's tautologically acyclic. The only extra thing is this uh, scheme complex L111, which, define, which is the way we define our auto equivalence corresponding to a crossing. So the scheme relations for GBR2 tells us that uh, the, uh, the, that we get two auto equivalences and some tautological as, as acyclic stuff. So here's our conjecture. The skein relations for GBRN are all skein relations for all possible embeddings of GBR with of lower index into GBRN. The stuff in the corner has to, uh, the skein complexes in the corner has to uh, convolve to an auto equivalence. And uh, on the diagonal, we always have auto equivalences. So I will give a bigger example in a second. Down this diagonal, we'll always have uh, L, P, Q, L, Q, P uh, for P plus Q equals to N. So we'll have P uh, crossing, uh, P strand crossing Q strand. And this we also want to be an auto equivalence. And everything else is acyclic. So for a square of sort of side N, the picture is auto equivalences in the corners, auto equivalences anti-diagonal, everything else is acyclic. So 
the, the two theorems we mentioned earlier tells us the conjecture holds for n equals two and three. So finally, this is the, what picture looks like in case uh, of n equals three. So uh, this is the uh, sort of picture of all scheme complexes which exist. Once again, we have in, the co in each corner, we have the same complex actually, which defines the ribbon twist dot equivalence, dot equivalence of the, of the category at the bottom, category three. Uh, the sides are acyclic. And the interior on the diagonal, we have auto equivalences. And these are this strange sort of complexes, uh, which uh, I asked uh, to be acyclic in my definition of scheme translator representation of GBRN, of GBR3, sorry. So if you remember the definition was, uh, these two guys are auto equivalences and they correspond to crossings. This is an auto equivalence, which in this, in the written uh, notes of this talk has no name, but we are now understand as the frame twist. And these two acyclic ones are precisely the only two remaining uh, uh, skin complexes. So uh, now we expect the cases for n greater than three to work out in a similar way. Uh, I wouldn't, I think conjecture is too uh, optimistic a word, but we uh, sort of, this is our current best guess. Uh, uh, we are at the moment busy uh, computing uh, n equals four case and seeing whether we can verify uh, that uh, everything as aside from the anti-diagonal has to be acyclic. So I'd like to finish here. Thank you for uh, your patience. Thank you, Tim. Thank you very much. And uh, let's thank uh, Tim in, in, uh, like in the yellow thing and uh, maybe in Zoom. Let's click about. Thank you. Okay, any questions? Okay. I, I have general questions. So basically, mm -hmm. what's your uh, next step? You plan to uh, solve? Uh, next step is to compute uh, N equals four keys and to uh, try to prove, uh, I, I mean, we have two examples. You, you see, the way this works is that we have two examples. Plug variety is a new hack algebra. So new hack algebra is very algebraic and very computable. So we'll compute every single skein complex and uh, we will uh, check whether it is uh, acyclic. So we, 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 will, we will see whether it's auto equivalence, whether it's a cyclic or whether we get some random junk. If, if our conjecture is verified and everything aside from the main diagonal is a cyclic, we'll next try to prove abstractly that if, we, if this scheme relations in case n equals four hold, uh, then we get representations of this, of, of this uh, generalized braids, which uh, involves uh, writing out uh, this uh, topological uh, generalized braid relations and then checking that the functors we define satisfy, uh, uh, satisfy them basically. You know, eventually we hope to do our case of arbitrary n, but you know, uh, I think this project will go on for a long time yet. Okay, thank you, thanks. And uh, okay, let me suggest, I learned it from uh, actually Alicia from London Center. Maybe let's try to switch on the camera so Tim can see all of us uh, who are still here. So uh, it makes seminar looks like real. I'm, I'm starting missing the real seminars. <laughs> yeah, a bit, a bit. Okay. Yeah. Hello, everyone. Okay, okay, okay. Yeah. Okay. Hi, Sasha. Okay. Oh, it's so nice to see familiar faces. Yeah, okay. Uh, Okay, and now let's thank Tim again. <laughs> thank you, Vani, and thank you for your patience. I'm sorry for running over, but I must uh, say that I think I ran over by 10 minutes, which is my personal... No, record. no, we started, later, no, we started uh, later than uh, normal. This is absolutely okay. This is absolutely okay. Yeah, okay, good. So, uh, good. Everything is okay. We keep running, so... Uh, uh, Welcome, uh, 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 but, uh, everyone uh, next week. Yeah. Uh, Vanya, Vanya, I think you can switch off the recording now. And oh, maybe sorry, sorry, sorry. Yeah, yeah. Edit this last <laughs> bit out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs>